Hello and welcome to the Street Crime UK YouTube channel. Please don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe. Today we're going to take a look at the history of gangs and gang related organised crime in the United Kingdom. Gang related organised crime in the United Kingdom is concentrated around cities of London, Manchester, Liverpool and regionally across the West Midlands region, South Coast and the Northern England according to the Serious Organised Crime Agency. With regard to street gangs, the cities identified as having the most serious gang problems, which also accounted for 65% of firearm homicides in England and Wales, were London, Birmingham, Manchester and Liverpool. Glasgow in Scotland also has a historical gang culture, with the city having as many teenage gangs as London, which had six times the population in 2008. In the early part of the 20th century, the city of Leeds, Bristol and Bradford, including Cayley and Nottingham, all commanded headlines pertaining to street gangs and suffered their share of high profile firearm murders. Sheffield, which has a long history of gangs, traced back to the 1920s in the book The Sheffield Gang Wars, along with Leicester, is one of the numerous urban centres seen to have an emerging or re-emerging gang problem. On the 28th of November 2007, a major offensive against gun crime by gangs in Birmingham, Liverpool, London and Manchester led to 118 arrests. More than 1,000 police officers were involved in the raid. Not all of the 118 arrested were gun related. Others were linked to drugs, prostitution and other crimes. The then Home Secretary Jackie Smith said it showed the police could fight back against gangs. In the 2000s, Britain's street gangs in certain inner city areas such as London and Manchester became influenced by America's Bloods and Crips. This was evidenced by the identification with colours hand signs, graffiti tags, and in some cases, gang names. For example, the Old Trafford Crips and the Mossoid Bloods, or the O3-1 or o one Bloods Gang and the ABM, all about money Crips. However, this phenomenon has since declined during the 2010. Debate persists over the extent of the nature of gang activity in the UK, with some academics and policymakers arguing that the current focus of enforcement efforts on gang memberships is inadvisable, given the lack of consensus over the relationship between gangs and crime. Due to austerity, there are fewer youth clubs and there is less provision for youngsters. This creates a vacuum. Youngsters, some children as young as 10, turn to gangs for friendships and protection. Later, young Youngsters get forced into illegal activities, notably selling and trafficking illegal drugs. Child labour was regulated for the first time in the UK in 1833 and therefore young children could no longer financially contribute to the family through jobs in a factory. Children were now spending more time on the streets whilst the rest of their families went to work all day. The lack of an extra stable source of income for families led to an increase in petty crimes among working class youths in the late 19th century. As children spent more time with siblings and neighbours on the street, pranks became commonplace and were viewed as devious attempts to outsmart authority. Along with pranking, petty crime among older teenagers was also on the rise. Because older teenagers could not earn enough money to support their families, especially in the absence of one parent, which was common, many resorted to stealing. Food and cigarettes were the most common forms of property that were stolen in the late 19th century. These small crimes and this culture of pranks added to the underlying resistance to the authority that existed among working class youths who had no other outlet to control their environment. The early groups in the 1840s were family orientated and were typically composed of brothers, sisters and neighbours. While petty crime rose everywhere during the 19th century in England, Individual crimes differed from city to city and even persisted in rural areas. But gangs were not unique to deprived areas and many arose in the many working class towns that were flourished from trade. Early forms of gangs were based upon territory and locality rather than certain ethnic or religious affiliations which tended to be defining characteristics of gangs in the early 20th century. Many of the names of early British gangs included titles of local areas and streets such as the Bengal Tigers who originated from Bengal Street in Manchester. The idea of hooliganism was used to describe 
these types of crimes committed by working class youth and drew great concern from the press and middle class during the time. Scuttlers was a specific term given to the perpetrators of these early petty crimes. These fractions were not highly organised and most people drifted in and out of the membership. However, the early development of petty crime with groups forming an identity for themselves through names and clothes helped create the framework for more organised crime groups that had gained great notoriety through the early 20th century. According to one report, Northern Ireland has over 150 active criminal gangs as of 2014. In Belfast in particular, a report in 2003 estimated there to be approximately 80 gangs, most nominally sectarian, engaged in racketeering across the city. An investigation in 2014 found that some gangs in Belfast were particularly hostile towards non-white residents of the city, with numerous cases of racially motivated violence, intimidation and extortion having been reported. Gangs in Belfast have been involved in people smuggling and human trafficking. Although the voice industry was previously mostly on the street, in recent years it has moved to indoors to residential homes and hotels and formed closer links to organised crime networks. Trafficking gangs in Belfast as in the rest of the Northern Ireland tend to be of Chinese or Eastern European origin utilising local people as facilitators in their network. In 2014, three nights of violence in East Belfast led to the Police Federation for Northern Ireland stating the gang culture has to be broken up so that people can go about their business without fear of being struck by a missile or intimidated. Peaky Blinders were a criminal gang based in Birmingham, England in the late 19th century and, to a lesser extent, the early 20th century. Philip Goddison, the author of The Gangs of Birmingham, states that the Peaky Blinders originated as a specific gang, but the term later became a generic label. An earlier gang known as the Cheapside Sluggers had evolved in the 1870s, and the term sluggers, meaning fighters, had already became a generic local label for street gangs. When the Peaky Blinders emerged at the end of the century in Adderley Street, in the Bordersley and Small Heath areas, which was an extremely deprived slum section of Birmingham at the time, the Peaky Blinders were distinguished by their sartorial style unlike other gangs. Notable members include David Taylor, who was in prison for carrying a gun at 13 years old, Babyface Harry Fowles, Ernest Hayes and Stephen McNichol. We have an in-depth video on the real Peaky Blinders, so if you get time go and check it out. Early in the 20th century, one of the Birmingham gangs known as the Brummagan Boys, Brummagan being the slang for Birmingham, began to spread their criminal network from the streets of Birmingham to around the country, helped by greatly improvised transport for the first time, regional gangs were able to expand beyond the streets that bred them. This new connecting railway between Birmingham and London meant that they could target the race course riches and the county's capital. Following the Handsworth riots in 1985, young people had banded together in groups which soon turned to petty crime and robbery. By the late 1980s, the Johnson crew, named after their Johnson's Calf hangout, controlled the drugs market and nightclub security across a large area of Birmingham. After a fallout between members of the Johnson crew, the Burger Bar boys formed, taking their name from a Soho Road fast food restaurant. Gang, a violent feud between the Johnsons and the Burger Bar boys, which was resolved in a truce instigated by Matthias Shabba Thompson in 2010, with assistance from documentary maker Penny Walcock. The process of forming the truce was captured in Channel 4's documentary One Mile Away. Following the truce, violent crime fell by 50% in the B6 postcode area and 30% in the B21 postcode. The increasingly collaborative relationship between the two gangs has led to some in the media describing them as more akin to a super gang, seeking to establish a greater national network of organised crime rather than controlling their postcode areas. Other reports suggest that both gangs are effectively inactive and there is no super gang. However, 20 shootings in mid-2015 onwards were linked to the feud between the Bergabar boys and the Johnson crew, suggesting that any truce is no longer active and the gang rivalry has been renewed.
The history of Glasgow gangs can be traced back to the 18th century, although the first media reference to Glasgow gangs was not until the 1870s with the acknowledgement of the penny mobs. It has been suggested that the rise in Glasgow gangs from the 1850s was a result of the influx of Irish immigration which included those from traditional Irish fighting gangs such as the Caravacs and the Shanavests. By the 1920s many Glasgow gangs were widely viewed as fighting gangs rather than criminal gangs although there were widespread reports of extortion and protection rackets particularly in in the city's east end and south side. By the 1930s, Glasgow had acquired a reputation throughout Britain as a hotbed of gang violence and was regarded at the time as Britain's answer to Chicago, which was home to some of America's most feared gangsters. The gangs at this time were also referred to as Glasgow Razor Gangs, named after their weapon of choice. One of Glasgow's most notorious gangs were the Billy Boys, a sectarian anti-Catholic gang who were formed in 1924 by William Fullerton after he was attacked by a group of Catholic youths. Many gangs in the east end of Glasgow, such as the Billy Boys' rivals, the Norman Conks, were both sectarian and territorial whereas in other districts, they were primarily territorial. The gang culture prevalent in the older, central areas of the city, such as the Gorbals, which became overcrowded and substandard in living conditions, did not disappear when these areas were cleared and redeveloped following World War II, with many of the inhabitants rehoused either in a cluster of power blocks or in a large peripheral overspill states like Easter House. Instead, as the job opportunities became limited in the post-industrial age, the structural flaws, planning mistakes, and related social issues became apparent in the schemes as the years passed. The heroin addiction spread throughout the city. New gangs, in addition to some which remained in the original areas, formed in the modern environments and remained prominent for decades, particularly in Glasgow's many areas of deprivation and poor health, where generations of young people suffered in childhood and found themselves with little to occupy their lives as teenagers, other than a cycle of thrilling but pointless collective recreational violence, usually fueled by alcohol, against similar groups from neighbouring districts. This lifestyle was depicted years later in movies such as Small Faces and Neds. Some of these young men moved into other criminal enterprises, including the operation of lucrative van routes in the city's East End schemes. During the 1980s, trading in stolen property and drugs, which were controlled by gangsters such as Tam Magor, with the resulting ice cream turf wars eventually culminating in the deaths of the family. An Evening Times report in 2008 stated that there were 170 gangs in Glasgow, whilst an earlier report in 2006 indicated a map showing the location of a list of Glasgow gangs. Along with incidents from other origins, including domestic violence and organised crime, the street gangs behaviour contributed to Glasgow being declared the murder capital of Europe in the mid 2000s. Gangs in Glasgow, some involved in the supply of drugs, house breakings and other illegal activity, but most simply a mob with minimal leadership structure focusing on enhancing their local reputation for notoriety and defending their bit or territory, marked their territory with tags and graffiti and adopted a particular style of dress and speech in each era, being defied as Ned culture. The majority of large-scale fights were organised in advance by phone calls and text messages and later by online contact, but at all times of the day, Rival neighbourhoods became a no-go area for gang members, as well as those young people who were not involved in the violence, but could be identified as residing in another area. The habitual carrying of knives and other weapons was commonplace, wherever the fear of attack was present, with serious and tragic consequences often resulting from confrontations when they did occur. Several campaigns were launched by law enforcement and government agencies to discourage the possession of weapons, including a 2009 program of checks on buses heading to the city centre, where the gangs would meet to fight when they left their own territory. An earlier campaign of the 1990s, Operation Blade, had initially appeared to produce results before the levels of weapon use and violence soon returned to previous levels and thereafter increased. Not all murders were gang related, but the prevailing culture in the city caused weapons to be carried as a matter of course and, in combination with the abuse of alcohol, 
serious incidents often occurred from very trivial disputes. The latter years of the 20th century saw an increase in Pakistani gangs, particularly in the south of Glasgow, in places like Pollock Shields. Pakistani gangs came to wider attention following the racially motivated murder of Chris Donald by local men of Pakistani origin in 2004. During that period, in the wake of Donald's murder, as well as the perception that asylum seekers who had been housed in empty properties in some of Glasgow's most run-down areas were being given priority over locals, some of the teenage gangs in those areas styled themselves as Nazis. In the decade following the publication of the Evening Time report the number of young people involved in young teams in Glasgow and the number of serious violent incidences recorded as a result of their activities reduced substantially. In 2016 contributors to an article in the same newspaper suggested the links to gang identity be embedded in local communities and unlikely to entirely disappear for many years. But that measures to combat the problems such as the police-led violence reduction unit which engaged with existing gang members, encouraging them to examine the negative consequences of their behaviour, to seek positive connections with their enemies such as Friday evening football games and outdoor pursuits and to provide opportunities for training and employment as an alternative to the lifestyle they had known and it had been effective to a noticeable extent. Other external factors such as increased availability of advanced internet enabled gaming technology and the widespread use of social media amongst youngsters which were acknowledged as having their own associated problems such as social isolation and online bullying as well as allowing the young teams a platform to boast of their exploits and taunt rivals also contributed to the general reduction in numbers of local teenagers regularly out on the streets bored and seeking companionship or confrontation with those who did openly express an affiliation to violent gangs more likely to face a negative reaction from the majority of their peers than in the past. In the wake of the rise in knife crime in England and Wales, particularly in London in the 2010s, it was reported that those areas were studying the approaches taken by Scotland in tackling the issue. However, it was recognised by the VRU that only around half of all the violent incidences which occurred were reported to the police as compared with figures from hospital admissions and other research. While violence related to organised crimes in part of the city, many of those involved as having graduated from local street gangs remained a significant issue. A 2020 Graham Armstrong novel, The Young Teen, narrated by a gang member in the local dialect, focuses on the neg culture of the region in the early 21st century, albeit set in Airdrie, North Lancashire, a few miles east of Glasgow, rather than in the city itself. Street gangs in Liverpool have been in existence since the mid 19th century. There were also various sectarian political gangs based in and around Liverpool during this period. Dr. Michael Kilwee of Liverpool Johns Moores University and the author of The Gangs of Liverpool state, you can learn lessons from the past and it's fascinating to compare the newspaper headlines of today with those from the late 1800s. The issues are exactly the same. People are worried about rising youth crime and the influence of Penny Dreadful on people's behaviour. Like today, some commentators demanded longer prison sentences and even flogging whilst others called for better education and more youth clubs. In the early 1980s, Liverpool was tagged by the media as Smack City or Skag City after it experienced an explosion in organised crime and heroin abuse, especially within the city's more deprived areas. At the same time, several criminal gangs began developing into drug dealing cartels in the city, including the Liverpool Mafia, which was the first cartel to develop in the UK. As drugs became increasingly valuable, large distribution networks were developed with cocaine producers in South America, including the Cali Cartel. Over time, several Liverpool gangsters became increasingly wealthy, including Colin Smigger Smith, who had an estimated fortune of 200 million, and Curtis Cocky Warren, whose estimated wealth once saw him on the Sunday Times Rich List. If you want to know more about Curtis Warren, we have a video on him, so go check it out if you get some time. 
It has also been suggested that distribution networks for illicit drugs within Ireland and the UK and even allegedly some Mediterranean holiday resorts are today controlled by various Liverpool gangs. A report in a UK newspaper written by journalist Peter Beaumont entitled Gangsters put Liverpool top of the gun league in the 28th of May 1995 observed that turf wars had erupted within Liverpool. The highest levels of violence in the city came to a head in 1996 when, following the shooting of gangster David Ungi, six shootings occurred in seven days, prompting Merseyside police to become one of the first police forces in the country to openly carry weapons in the fight against gun crime. Official Home Office statistics revealed a total of 3,387 offences involving firearms had occurred in the Merseyside region during a four-year period between 1997 and 2001. It was revealed that Liverpool was the main centre for organised crime in the north of England. In August 2007, the ongoing war between two rival gangs caused nationwide outrage when an innocent 11-year-old Rhys Jones was shot in the neck and died in his mother's arms in the car park of the Fir Tree pub in Croxteth, Liverpool. On the 16th of December 2008, Sean Mercer was convicted of the murder and ordered to serve a minimum tariff of 22 years by the trial judge, Mr Justice Irwin. London was the first city noted to have a major problem with criminal gangs, followed thereafter by American cities such as New York City, Chicago and Los Angeles. A number of street gangs were present in London during the 20th century, many in the East End, often referred to as mobs. These including the Yiddishers, the Hoxton mob, the Watney Streeters, the Old Gate mob, the Whitechapel mob, the Bethnal Green mob and the organised Italian mob headed by Charles Sabine. The history of these gangs is well documented in London's underworld, three centuries of vice and crime. The Paul Moore Gazette released a research report on gangs and crime in England in 1888. They discussed the downfall and dissolution of a gang called the Skeleton Army a few years before the hand and include a collection of nine gangs and their respective territories gathered from contemporary police reports, which were as followed. The Marylebone Gang, which ran Lisson Grove. The Fitzroy Place Gang, which ran Regent's Park. The Monkey Parade Gang, which ran Whitechapel. The Black Gang, which ran Union Street Borough. The New Cut Gang, which ran New Cut in Lambert. The Green Gate Gang, which ran City Road. The Prince Arthur Gang, which ran Duke Street in Blackfairs. And the Gang of Roofs, which ran Norwood. And the Jovial 32 which ran Upper Holloway. On the 21st of February 2007, the BBC reported on an unpublished Metropolitan Police report on London's gang culture, identifying 169 separate groups, with more than a quarter said to have been involved in murders. The report's accuracy has been questioned by some London boroughs for being inaccurate in places and the existence of certain gangs on the list which could not be substantiated. The Centre for Social Justice identifies the gangs in London's website as a useful tool in creating an overall picture of London gangs. As highlighted in the report Dying to Belong, an in-depth review of street gangs in Britain, which was led by Conservative leader Ian Duncan in 2009. In February 2007, criminologist Dr John Pitts from the University of Bedfordshire said, there are probably no more than 1,500 to 2,000 young people in gangs in all of London, but their impact is enormous. There is no methodology to suggest where this number came from and how it was obtained. Furthermore, in December 2007, in a report written by Mr Pitts on Lambeth gangs, he claims that a dominant gang, the PDC from Angeltown, boasts 2,500 members. Probably a more accurate estimation for gang membership, although dated, can be found in the 2004 Home Office document, Delinquent Youth Groups and Offending Behaviour. The report, using methodology developed by American gang experts and practitioners, estimated that 6% of young people aged 10 to 19 were classified as belonging to a delinquent youth group, although based on the most stringent criteria, this was 4%. There is a modern history of London gangs dating from the 1970s, although many of them emerged from subcultures such as pranks, 
Rastas and football hooligans. Two well-known subcultures involved in violent clashes during Notting Hill riots in the 1950s, the Teddy Boys and the Rue Boys, could well be labelled gangs in today's media. Amongst the current London gangs whose history does go back to the 1970s are the Peckham Boys and the Tottenham Mandem both predominantly or entirely black. Native British gangs remain active while there are several Asian gangs in London, such as the Brick Lane Massive, who are predominantly of Bangladeshi descent, initially formed to protect their local communities from racist attacks and from the native white population. Since the 2000s, Tamil gangs in Croydon and Wembley have been active such as the Wembley Boys and the Tamil Snake Gang. Tamil Hindu gangs in London are also featured as one of the major ethnic gangs in Ross Kemp's documentary on London Gang. A gang database for London estimated that 78.2% of members were black and 12.8% were white, 6.5% were Asian which covered Pakistani, Indian and Bangladeshi and 2.2% were Middle Eastern and Arab and under 1% were East Asian or of unknown ethnicity. London gangs are increasingly marking their territory with gang graffiti, usually a gang name and the postcode area of a housing estate which they identify with. In some cases they may tag the street road sign in their area with an identified gang color as can be seen in Edmund. This is not a new phenomenon and has been practiced by many London gangs in the past, although today it is a more integral part of the gang culture. Many gangs have a strong sense of belonging to their local areas and often take their names from the housing estates, districts and postcode areas which they are located. In some areas the postcodes act as rival gang boundaries, although this is not a general rule as there can be rival gangs present within the same postcode area as well as gangs that occupy multiple Postcodes. In 2018, researchers from the London South Bank University found that gangs in the London borough of Walton Forest that used to be organised around the postcode rivalries had moved beyond territorial disputes to focus on profit making activities such as drug dealing. They cite James Densley's gang evolution model which details how gangs progress from recreational goals and activities like defending postcodes to financial goals and activities like drug dealing. Mr. Densley concludes that fully evolved gangs resemble not just crime that is organised, but organised crime. Mr. Densley also found that gangs in London had also used hand signs and gang tattoos to denote gang membership. Some gangs in London are motivated by religion, as is the case with the Muslim patrol. However, profits arising from drugs and other criminal activity is a significant motivator for many gangs. The first recorded gangs in Manchester were Scutlers, which were youth gangs that recruited boys and girls between 14 and 21 years of age. They had became prominent among the slums during the second half of the 19th century, but had mostly disappeared by the beginning of the 20th century. In the mid 1980s, a growth in violence amongst black British youths from the west side of Alexandra Park in the south of Manchester and their rivals, the West Indians living to the north of the city in Cheatham Hill, began to gain media attention. The city has sometimes been dubbed in the media as Gangchester or Gunchester. Gang culture spread into many deprived areas of South Manchester. A gang related crime occurred on the 9th of September 2006 in Mossel, where Jesse James, a 15 year old schoolboy was shot dead in the early hours of the morning. His shooting is said to have been the result of the mistaken identity for a rival gang member. To this day his murderer or murderers have not been found. In April 2009, 11 members of the Gooch gang were found guilty on a number of charges ranging from murder to drug offences. The Gooch gang had a long standing rivalry, the equally well known Doddington gang. The Gooch gang operated with a tiered structure. On the top of the gang, were the gang's leaders, Colin Joyce and Lee Amos, and below them were the members controlling the supply and distribution of drugs to the street dealers at the bottom. The gang was earning an estimated £2,000 a day, with street dealers allowed to keep £100 a day for themselves. After 2001, when Mr Joyce and Mr Amos were sent to prison on firearm charges, there followed a 92% drop in gun crime in central Manchester. If you'd like to know more about the Gooch gang, 
we have a video on them so please check it out if you get time the official gun enable crime figures showed a 17 percent reduction in manchester when comparing the 2005 2006 1200 offenses and the 2006 2007 993 offenses However, this was followed by an increase of 17% in 2007-2008 of 1,160 offences compared to 2006-2007. In 2009, shootings were reported as falling by 82% compared with the previous year. In addition to this, many ethnic gangs can be found within Manchester, as well as black and Pakistani gangs being the most prominent, founded in areas such as Rochdale and Oldham, where criminal charges range from carrying firearms to murder. Manchester is also home to the Inner City Gibbers, an equivalent within the city's main hooligan gang that uses football hooliganism to cover for acquisitive forms of crime. According to former Manchester United hooligan Colin Blaney in his autobiography The Undesirables, members of the gang have been involved in serious forms of crime such as drug smuggling from Latin America and the Caribbean, carrying out armed robberies and committing robberies on drug dealers. In an interview with Vice, members of the gang spoke of connections with the Liberian drug smuggling cartels and convictions for offences including armed robbery, credit card fraud and the sale of Casse drugs. A number of the criminal gangs in the United Kingdom specialise in the importation, production and sale of illicit drugs. Of the 2,800 gangs identified within the United Kingdom, it is estimated that 60% are involved in drugs. Among them are the Yardies, also known as the Posses in America, who are generally associated with crack cocaine. In 2003, it was reported that Yardie drug gangs were present in 36 of the 43 police force areas in England and Wales. One of the more prominent were the Aggie crew in Bristol. In 1998, six members of the Aggie crew were imprisoned after being found in possession of over £1 million worth of crack cocaine. If you'd like to know more about the Aggie crew, we have a video on them, so check it out if you get time. There were raids across the city, which was the latest phase of Operation Aterium, launched in 2001 to clamp down on the drug-related crime in Bristol by disrupting organised gangs. Over 960 people were arrested over 18 months. In 2009, the Olympian and judo expert James Waif was convicted of drug offences, having been an enforcer for a drug ring that made nearly £50 million annually. Asian drug gangs, usually of Pakistani and Tamil descent, are also present in the United Kingdom. Notable Tamil gangs include the Harold Tamils and the Wemily Tamils. Pakistani gangs have been recorded to be associated with the importation and distribution of heroin and can be found in Luton, Bradford, Birmingham, Manchester, Huddersfield, Slough, Bedford and Middlesbrough. Drug squad officers in 2003 claimed that Asian gangs were actively seeking to corner the heroin market. In other reports, it has been suggested that Turkey replaced Pakistan and Afghanistan as the most important transit point for heroin and it has been estimated that 80% of heroin intercepted by British authorities belonged to Turkish gangs, which previously belonged to Pakistani and Afghan gangs. A recent spate of murders in London in 2009 have been linked to a heroin drugs war involving the Turkish and Kurdish gangs in North London. It's believed that the feud is between two organised drug gangs, the Turkish Tottenham Boys and the Bomber Clear or Bombers from Hackney. The Bombers were led by Abdullah Babyson, who was said to be Britain's largest importer of heroin. He was convicted in 2006. Although most assumptions surrounding gang culture in the UK surrounded male-dominated narratives, females also played a role in gangs in Britain in the late 19th century and the early 20th centuries. Society saw women as co-conspirators, supporters and even perpetrators of a gang crime in the late 19th century. In 1898, the Manchester Guardian wrote in an article that girls incited conflicts between the gangs and were thus responsible for the majority of scuttling the phrase. This article reflects how women were viewed as sexual objects, causing a lot of fights and violence that occur between gangs. While historians such as Stephen Humphreys support this claim that women played a supporting role in gangs, 
Andrew Davis argues that women played a much more active one. One of the most famous gangs in the early 20th century was an all-known female gang in London called the 40 Elephants. By 1890, the 40 Elephants chose their first queen and established themselves as free from male control. Led by Alice Diamond during its height in 1915, gang was notorious for stealing expensive clothing partying amongst the wealthy, engaging in violent robberies and for being romantically involved with other gang leaders around London. When it came to court, the magistrates treated the women's involvement in gangs differently to that of men. If you'd like to know more about the 40 elephants, we have a video on them, so please check it out if you get some time. The concern over female crime related to the deviation from typical notions of femininity and morality. Thus, women typically receive lesser sentences than men. Due to the conventional idea of femininity that saw women as weaker than men, many courts would have believed it impossible to view women as orchestrators of such a crime. Most women were assumed to have played a supporting role. Britain has a number of traditional organised crime firms or local British crime families. Some of the most well known include the Cray Twins, the Richardson Gang and the Clerkenwell Crime Syndicate in London. Outside the capital there were the Noonans of Manchester, Thomas McGaw of Glasgow and Curtis Warren from Liverpool who are among some of the most infamous. Sectarian or political gangs have featured in British cities such as Liverpool in England, Glasgow in Scotland and Belfast in Northern Ireland. Belfast has been the capital of Northern Ireland since its establishment in 1921, following the Government of Ireland Act 1920. Since its emergence as a major city, it has been the scene of various episodes of sectarian conflict between its Roman Catholic and Protestant populations. The Ulster Protestant Association is said to have provided many members of the murder gangs acted in Belfast during 1921 and 20. Other Protestant gangs active at that time were the Imperial Guards, Crawford's Tigers and the Cromwell Clubs. These opposing groups in this conflict are now often termed Republican and Loyalist respectively, although they are often referred to as Nationalists and Unionists. The most recent example of this is known as the Troubles, a civil conflict that ranged from the 1969 to the late 1990s. Belfast saw some of the worst troubles in Northern Ireland particularly in the 1970s, with the rival paramilitary groups forming on both sides. Bombings, assassination and street violence formed as a backdrop to life throughout the Troubles. The provisional IRA detonated 22 bombs, all in a confined area of the city centre in 1972, in what was known as Bloody Friday killing nine people. The IRA also killed hundreds of other civilians and members from security forces. Loyalist paramilitaries, the Ulster Volunteer Force, the UVF, and the Ulster Defence Association, the UDA, claim that the killings they carried out were in relation to the PRIA campaign. Most of their victims were Roman Catholic civilians, unconnected to the provisional IRA. A particularly notorious group based in the Shank Hill Road in the mid-1970s became known as the Shankill Butchers. In all, over 1,500 people were killed in political violence in the city from 1969 to 2001. Part of the legacy of the Troubles is that both Republican and Loyalist paramilitary groups in Belfast have become involved in organised crime and racketeering. Historically, social fears of gangs have centred around the framework which argued that effects like increased mass population, consumption, democracy and communication led to the rise of organised crime groups. There was a general consensus amongst the middle classes that there was an increasing violence amongst working class men due to these forces during the late 19th century. Newspapers used inflammatory language to convey a sense of lawness and excessive violence among working class towns which added to these growing assumptions. The widely held belief of British intellectuals in the 20th century was that the gangs reflected the working class rejection of middle class traditional values and the norms. This view contributed to the way experts studied gangs throughout the 20th century and served as proof of an innate immorality around working class citizens. 
Two historians have done extensive research in this field and represent two different views of the underlying causes of the rise of gang culture between the late 19th century and the early 20th centuries. Stephen Humphreys argues that these early groups can be seen as the results of social crime. For the working class, they viewed these crimes as righteous and justified against society that had left them to struggle. It was therefore fair to steal from them what they had been deprived of. According to Mr Humphrey, gangs were a way for the working class youth to respond to feelings of insignificance that came with living in a large, uniform, industrial town with no way to escape. Petty crimes were thus a way to respond to all the top-down authority they were receiving from factory managers, teachers, the police and the government. His analysis of interviews with former gang members led him to the idea that gangs allow working class youths to feel rebellious and to also express the need to resist the monotonous nature of industrial towns. Building on this idea, Andrew Davies argues that the concept of masculinity amongst the working class men prompted this behaviour and was a way for members to prove themselves to their peers. He connects acts of violence committed in the household to idealised criminals in popular culture at the time that would have contributed to the working class idea of masculinity. However, in in other works, he notes that how many women took part in organised crimes, thus proving that this idea was not the only motive for gang crime. In 2014, the Runnymede Trust suggested that despite the well-rehearsed public disclosure around modern youth gangs and gang culture, we actually know very little about gangs in the UK, about how a gang might be defined or understood, and what being part of a gang means. We know still less about how the gang links to levels of youth violence. Professor Simon Hallsworth argues that where they exist, the gangs in the UK are far more fluid, volatile and amorphous than the myth of the organised group with a corporate structure. The assertion is supported by the field study conducted by Manchester University which found that most within and between gang disputes emanated from interpersonal disputes regarding friends, family and romantic relationships as opposed to territorial rivalries and criminal enterprises were rarely gang coordinated. Most involved gang members operating as individuals or in small groups. Mr Cottrell Boyce, writing in the Youth Justice Journal, argues that gangs have been constructed as a suitable enemy by politicians and the media, obscuring the wider structural roots of youth violence. At the level of enforcement, a focus on gang membership may be counterproductive, creating confusion and resulting in a dragnet approach which can criminalise innocent young people rather than focusing resources on serious violent crimes. Thank you for joining us today. What are your opinions of the gangs in the United Kingdom? Do you think the police have done a good job decreasing the number of gangs or do you think gangs are on the rise? Please let us know what you think in the comments below. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed this content, please don't forget to like and share and if you're new to the channel and want to see more street crime uk content hit subscribe and press that bell so you can join us on the next video thank you for joining us and until next time stay safe